Bibles, please, to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 9. If you need the notes, just hold your hand up. I'm in ready to serve you with those. 2 Samuel chapter 9. Thank you so much for coming out the last service of 2020. What a year it's been. But you know, it didn't surprise God one little bit. Uh, he knew it was coming. He knew it was going to transpire. He knew it. And so I'm glad we can just rest in that, that uh, he's still on the throne, still got in control. And so tonight, looking at just a simple thought tonight, showing the kindness of God. Showing the kindness of God. 2 Samuel chapter 9. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not any, yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Micar, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Micar, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar, now when Mesibetheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mesibetheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, that thou, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, what is thy servant, that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertaineth to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits, that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mesibetheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mesibetheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mesibetheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all that dwelleth in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mesibetheth. So Mesibetheth dwelleth in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table, and was lame on both his feet. Father, we ask you to help us tonight. Lord, what an amazing little passage, what an amazing little thought that you give us in this brief window in the life of David and Mesibetheth. Father, I ask that you open the windows of heaven and show us the truth, show us something that will stir us, show us, show us something that as we go into 2021 that will make a difference in our life. Father, help us get our eyes off ourselves, help us get our eyes off our problems, but get our eyes onto those who have a great need, those who you want to reach, those you want to love, those you want to build, those you want to bring into the fold. Lord, help us have a desire to see even those that are saved but are straying, Lord, that they would come back. So God, again, help us this evening, please, that we might be able to show many people the kindness of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Again, if you look at verse number 3, it's kind of the focal verse for tonight as we looked at this story. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show kindness of God unto him? If you remember the story, and I trust that you do, about Saul and about Jonathan and about David, how Saul had got jealous over David and was going and spent the rest of his life trying to kill David, trying to destroy David. And Saul, Jonathan, whose heart was knit with David, Jonathan, of course, was going to be the next king. If it wasn't for David, and if David didn't survive, Jonathan was going to be the next king of Israel. But Jonathan knew God's plan and loved David and helped serve David. We know Saul and Jonathan were killed, and David then took the reins progressively to be king. And now he's at that point, he's, the world has settled down for him, and he says, you know, he said he wanted to go back and do something. He wanted to show the kindness of God to Saul's people. So there we have in verse number 
3 again, And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. The story is that when, he was John, when, when Saul and Jonathan were killed in battle, the nurse had taken Mesibetheth, the little child there at that time, and ran and then had fallen and dropped him and made him lame. And so one of the kinfolks of Saul had taken Mesibetheth, the lame little boy, and taken him into his own house and took care of him for all these years. And now David is king, and David is looking to follow up with the promise he made to Jonathan, promise up a, a, a desire to help Jonathan and his people, and say, I want to show a certain kindness to Jonathan's people. The purpose of tonight is to give a little mantra, if you will, give us a, a mission, give us a motive for service and a passion for souls and for soul winning and a force of forgiveness to show the kindness of God. That's what he said. He said, I want to be able to show the kindness of God. I hope that's our desire, to get our eyes off ourselves, to get our eyes off of what we're doing for ourselves and what we're doing for our families, and just show the kindness of God. What a desire, what a mantra. If you want a good New Year's resolution, there is one. God, help me this year to show your kindness to those around me. Let me show the kindness of God. Let's start this in our own houses, <laughs> man. Let me show the kindness of God to that rascal husband I've got. And yes, he is a rascal, I know that. But show the kindness of God to him. Show the kindness of God to those teenagers. Oh, show the kindness of God to those two-year-olds. Show the kindness of God to the in-laws and outlaws that you have in your family. Show the kindness of God to the neighbors. Just showing the kindness of God. What an amazing thing. He said, I may show the kindness of God into him. You know, David had seen the kindness of God. God had seen God, David had seen God working in his own life. He saw God calling from following the sheep. David, as we know the story, when the prophet got the word, he's going to come from the sons of Jesse, went to Jesse, and they saw the ones that were looked big and tall and looked the ones that were good and went son after son after son, and none of them were chosen, and David had been kind of left out in the field because, after all, nobody would think about David and brought him in, and he was going to be the next king. So he was called from following the sheep. So, God had, so David had seen the kindness of God and just calling him out from the lowliest position. He had seen the kindness of God in protecting him from Saul. As he was serving Saul, Saul had tried to kill him many times there in the palace, and God protected him. You know, it's an amazing thing that even after Saul tried to kill him, David still tried to do his job. David still maintained. David still came back. David still played the music. David was still his ambassador. David was still his general, even when Saul tried to kill him. Well, how quick we get upset and just quit everything. But no, David knew that was his spot for the time, and so he was just there. But so God had protected him from Saul. God had forgiven David for many falters he had had both as he was growing up and as he was king and young king. He was, and now he wanted to show God's mercy, God's forgiveness, God's blessings to others. He'd seen the power of God. He'd seen the, the protection of God. He says, boy, I've, now I've got a desire to, to serve God, and I want to share that with somebody else. I want to remember my friend Jonathan, and I want to share this with somebody. And so I had, he had a great burden and concern to give it to others. By the way, we ought to have the same desire to show the kindness of God to those around us. You say, preacher, why should I win souls? To show the kindness of God. Why should I hand out a tract? To show the kindness of God. Why should I try to bring people to church? To show the kindness of God. Why should I be kind when people are upset with me? To show the kindness of God. Why should I go out of my way and exert myself and change my behavior and change my activity and change my finances just to do that? Because we want to show the kindness of God. We're so self-focused. We're so self-centered. And he said, I want to find somebody from Jonathan's house to show the kindness of God. We need to sense that burden to show the kindness of God. Aren't you glad you're saved tonight? 
Aren't you glad God shows us His kindness week after week, day after day, year after year, and we claim that salvation, we claim He loves us and cares for us and provides for us and coming back. And we say, oh, God is so kind. God is so good. Well, David said, I want to show that kindness of God to somebody else. That ought to be our burden. That ought to be our mantra. That ought to be our desire. And so that's what we find here. David is calling his, his, his servants and says, is there anybody left in the house of Saul? Is there anybody else I can show the kindness of God to? Somebody to Jonathan, whom I loved and who was my friend. Saul, who was God's first chosen king of Israel. He said, I want to show the kindness of God. Is there anybody left in Saul's house? And we saw the story. He said, there's one. Cripple. There's one. Let's hear tonight that and since that burden of trying to show the kindness of God to people. To show the kindness of God that He showed to us, that He showed it to somebody else. So let's learn tonight. Let's grow from it tonight. Let's understand, just look very simple at this very simple story we have of Mesibetheth and King David. First of all, let's notice the king's modus. The king's modus. That's a mode of procedure, a way of doing something is what that means. The king's modus. Notice, first of all, the reflection of providence. The reflection of providence. So here's the king, and he says, I want to do something. And he wanted to show the kindness of God. He, he wasn't trying to get the kindness of God. He was trying to show the kindness of God. He wasn't trying to be God. He said, I want to show the kindness of God. He said, I want the kindness of God to come into me and to flow out. He said, I've seen it. I've experienced it. I want to deliver it. I want to have that providence of God, and I want to reflect that and show that kindness of God. That's what he had said. He said in verse number 3, and, so, and King said, Is there not any a house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? He had seen the kindness of God. He had experienced the kindness of God. David had it in his life. And now he wanted to show that kindness to somebody else. Oh, when's the last time you felt a burden to show the kindness of God to somebody else? To show the goodness of God to somebody else. To let us be that vehicle for the blessings and goodness of God. Dr. Jack Hiles years ago used to preach a sermon, and his sermon basically was this, and he would demonstrate it. That's what King David was. He said, I want to show the kindness of God. I want to show the blessings of God and give it to somebody else to pass it along. He said, is there anybody in Saul's household, anybody from my previous enemy, is there anybody in his household, is there anybody in his family that I can show the kingness of God? He had seen it, he had experienced it, and now he wanted to model the kindness and goodness of God. Well, we just need to show it. We have that, need to have that desire to communicate and do that. Are we doing that? Problem is, like you and I, we're kind of like the lepers, or should be like the lepers outside the camp. Do you remember the story about how the children of Israel, the city had been surrounded, and they had been surrounded so long that they couldn't get any food in or out, and people were dying, and people were eating each other's kids, and they were just eating the heads of donkeys. It was just a mess. And there were some lepers on the outside. Everybody was dying on the inside. Everybody was starving on the inside. A couple of lepers outside the city said, we got to do something. If we go inside, they'll kill us because we're lepers. They don't want us there. He says, but you know, we might go to the enemy. And the worst they'll do is kill us, and we're going to die anyway. But they may feed us. They may take care of us. So he said, let's go see what happens. And so they went. And the Bible tells us, and when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp of the enemy that surrounded the city that made the city be in such a terrible state that kept them boxed in for so long they couldn't get any food and everybody was cannibalizing. It was just a miserable place because the enemy had surrounded it. And when these lepers came out to the uttermost part of the camp, the enemy camp that had surrounded the city, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thin silver. They got there and everybody was gone. They got there and God had scared them off. God had chased them away and the whole camp was gone. And so when these lepers came to the outermost panel of the camp, they went one to another and did eat and drink and carried thin silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it. Well, you can just see them. 
These lepers who were about to die and starving to death and been an outskirt and a scourge of the city for years, and now they go there and says, wow, the place is empty, the food is cooked, they've got the hot coffee sitting right there, they've got the Boston cream pie already made and cut on the place, they've got the rare ribeye steak sitting there just right and warming. Wow, we are all set. They went into one tent, the Bible says, and they ate, they went to another tent and carried out the food and just tent the tent until they just got wore out, basically. And then it's when they came... They did eat and drink and carried thence the gold and silver raiment and went and hid and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. I mean, they just went from tent to tent till they were just wore out, carrying away the gold and the silver and the food. Man, what a time they were having. Then they said one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go tell the king's household. It came to him and said, we've got all these blessings, but people are dying inside. We've got all this that we can want, but their people are dying inside. He said, before something happens to us, we've got to make sure we get the word out. And so they went and they told. That's very much the same picture we have here. David said, I want to do something for God's people. I want to do something for Saul's kinfolk. I want to do something for Jonathan and his people. That'll be our desire, to show the kindness of God. And that's, and that's what Jonathan, David said. He says, is there anybody left I can show the kindness of God to? Because God has been so good to us, because God has saved us, because God has provided for us, that ought to be our heart's desire. That ought to be our mantra, if you will. That ought to be our, if you want a good New Year's resolution, there's one for you right there, to spend this next year showing the kindness of God to those around. Just what God has given us to give to somebody else. Just how God has blessed us to bless somebody else, to get our eyes off ourselves and get our eyes on the people. So we find the reflection of providence. He said, I want to show not my kindness, I want to show the kindness of God. And when he said, when I do this, is I'm not looking to show how good I am. I'm not looking to show how spiritual I am. He said, I'm not trying to show how powerful I am. I'm not trying to show them what a good Christian I am. He said, I want to show them the kindness of, talk to me, class, God. I want, boy, that ought to be our mantra. That ought to be our desire to say, in my life this year, in 2021, I want people to see God in my life. I want to show the kindness of God to those around me. I want to show the blessings of God to other people. I want to be a conduit, if you will, as Dr. Howe's little sermon was, silent sermon. I want to take from God and give it to somebody else. I want to take the blessings of God and find somebody else that God wants me to give it to. And I want to be just that conduit. And that's what David said. God has made me king. He's blessed me. He's brought me to this place. He says, now I want to show the kindness of God to somebody else. That ought to be our burden. So the king's modus was, he said, I want to just show some the, the goodness of God, the kindness of God to somebody else. Let that be our desire. We're so selfish, we just want to keep it to ourselves or we don't even think about it, even though we've been so blessed. So we find the reflection of providence. That was the king's modus. That was his desire. That was his plan. Secondly, we find without respect of person. It was a reflection of providence. It was a reflection of what God had done for him. He said, I want to show the kindness of God. He said, I'm sitting here on the throne. God has blessed me. God has protected me. God has given me all these things. He said, now I want to give it to somebody else. He said, now I want to pass that along. So he said, I just want to be a reflection of providence. You say, preacher, why should I care about people? Just to reflect God's goodness to you. Just to reflect how God has blessed you. Just pass it on to somebody else. But then he said, I want to do it without respect of persons. Respect of persons. That's why he said, verse number three, and the king said, is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? He said, is there anybody left? He didn't say, is there anybody you think I'd get along with that I should show the kindness of God to? He didn't say, you don't, you don't think there's anybody out there that, 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 that kind of melts with me and I can get along with and everybody be happy. No. He didn't say, is there somebody very intelligent? Is there anybody very really powerful out there that I can show the kindness of God to? He didn't say, is there somebody out there that's really influential and help our kingdom along and to do that? Is there anybody out there that... No, he says, is there anybody? Is there anybody? Look at verse number three. And the king said, is... There not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show kindness to. 
We need to be seeking people of all ages and of all types. Are you listening to me? Is there anyone? Is there anybody? All kinds of issues, all colors, all nationalities. We just make sure we're going after those that God sends our way. Regardless of how intelligent they are, regardless of how functioning they are, regardless of how rich they are, regardless of how poor they are, without respect of person. David didn't say, I want somebody from, from Saul's house, somebody from Jonathan's family. He said, but, but they've got to be right. They've got to be, after all, he said, they're going to be in my house. I'm gonna, they're going to serve me. They've got to be dressed just right. They've got to act just right. He said, you find, no, he said, just anybody. He said, I want to help somebody. Is there yet any? Well, that's why we've got to make sure that God, when God brings somebody to our path, that we go after them. So, well, they don't look just like us. They don't act just like us. Guess what? You didn't look like you once. You didn't act like you once. You think back before you got saved, remember how you were living? Or maybe even after you got saved, times in your life, you weren't acting like you would like to be, you wouldn't want to be with yourself. You look at yourself like you were 10 years ago. You say, I wouldn't want to be with me. I wouldn't trust me. I wouldn't want to have coffee with me. I wouldn't want to. But now you say, God's done a work in my life, and God's helped me. And with people that God sent my way, he helped bring things along. You say, boy, now, now it's time for us to go back. So David said, I'm looking for somebody who's hurting. I'm looking for hurting or not. He said, somebody from Saul's family, somebody from Jonathan's family. He said that I can be a blessing. So without respect of person. Oh, we have to be careful. We're not real selective on who we love for the cause of Christ. Oh, it's so easy for us to be picking and choosing. Who. He said, is there yet anybody? He said, is there anybody? Very quickly, just look at some notes about this one that... He said, yeah, there is one. Mesibetheth. First of all, we find his profitableness. It was not. He was lame. This Mesibetheth, he was lame. He was crippled. In 2 Samuel 4, 4, it says, And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame on his feet. And he was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. In other words, when they heard Saul and Jonathan are killed. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mesibetheth. He was running from the fall of Saul, basically dropped by his nurse. And he was crippled. And he was brought in by a family member to take care of him for the rest of his life. Well, if you think about that song, I was faint from many a fall. Well, aren't you glad God, aren't you glad God saved you? Aren't you glad even though we weren't profitable to God at the time that He saved us? By the way, we're only profitable to God because He profits us through Him. And He through us. So we find His profitableness. It was not. He was lame. So David says, here, bring him in. So here he is. He's going to have somebody to come into his household. Somebody's going to restore to, to a position of authority, if you will. Somebody who's going to show the kindness for, for Jonathan's sake. And he comes in and he's a cripple. You know, in those days, cripples weren't magnified like they are today cripples were pretty they were if they had somebody to take him to the pool then lay down or somewhere to beg they were lucky if not they'd just have to starve to death but here a family member had brought him in he said i want you to bring him to him so his profitableness not he was lame his place that he came from we just read lodabar which means pastureless he was living in a place called lodabar no pasture by the way if you've got a place there's no pasture back there you were hurting that was a miserable place. That was a poor place. That was a dry, thirsty land, if you will. Notice his people. His people was the enemies of the king. Remember, they had, he was basically been in hiding because Saul and David had been at battle against each other. Saul was trying to kill David and, and had been spending much time. And so when Saul fell, he said, We're, this is bad news. We're in trouble now. He said, our protector is gone. And so they went and basically he had gone and hid. So this family at that point, basically what they, as way, uh, way they thought about it, of enemies of the king, because Saul and Jonathan had been fighting against him. Then we see his person, which means dispeller of shame. Dispeller of shame, trying to get rid of shame, trying to get rid of the shame that his family had. Wow. The king's motives, the reflection of providence. He says, oh, God's been good to me. I want to show the kindness of God. God is, 
we might say, God's been good to me. I want to be good to somebody else. God's been good to me. I want to show God's goodness to them. Uh, God, God saved me. I want to see God save somebody else. God sent somebody to me and gave me the gospel. I want to take the gospel to somebody else. Boy, he saw, I just wanted to read the reflection of providence, and it was without respect of person. He said, just whoever it is. Very quickly, notice the king's motive. The king's motive. For Jonathan's sake. Verse number one. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? For Jonathan's sake. We think of that picture of what Christ has done for us. Let me just read it to you. I think it's in your notes. Ephesians 4, 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Are you catching that last part there? Even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. The Bible teaches us that God forgives us for Christ's sake. Because Christ died for us, because Christ went to the cross for us, He forgives us for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake. That's the model for us for soul winning and for forgiving other people. For Christ's sake. So I don't feel like going out. We go out for Christ's sake. We forgive people who hurt us for Christ's sake. God loves us, so He loves the world. And so we find here that David wanted to do it for the sake, if you will, of Jonathan. By the way, God forgives us for Christ's sake, for the sake of Christ. How dare we not forgive people for the sake of Christ? Think about that. God forgives us for Christ's sake. How can we not be completely forgiven of somebody else? Well, you don't understand how mean they were to me. <laughs> Do we understand what our sins did to Christ? But you don't understand how, how rotten they are. Do we understand how rotten we are and were? The king's motive was forgiveness. How dare we not forgive for God? For Christ's sake has forgiven us. That's our model. That ought to be our mantra. Forgive. Forgive. I'm sure if I stop and ask each of you, you could tell me somebody that did you wrong, somebody that did you dirty, somebody that shortchanged you, somebody that was not right to you. I hope that you're able to the place where, for Christ's sake, forgive them. And that's what, what he says. He says, I want to look for somebody to be a blessing. Very quickly, we notice the king's movement. The king's movement. The king sought him out. The king sought him out. Look at verse number 3. And the king said, Is there not any yet of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba, who had been the servant, said unto him, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is in the house of Micar, the son of Amiel of Lodiar. And Lodabar. And the David sent and fetched him out of the house of Micar, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. And when Mesibetheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mesibetheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore all the land of Saul thy father. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Notice very quickly, the king sought him out. The king sought him out. Aren't you glad God set, sought you out? Hey, he sought him out. He sought him out. We sing that song, He came to me. When I could not go where he was, he came to me. So we find the king seeking him out. He said, I'm looking for somebody. He said, where is king, uh, Saul's king, uh, kinfolk? Where is the son of Jonathan? Romans 3.11 says, There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. But I'm glad he came and sought us. Sometimes, well, I'm seeking God. No, most folks aren't really seeking God. They're seeking religion. They're seeking some sort of 
peace in their heart, but they're not seeking God. For God so loved the world, though, that He gave His only begotten Son. Oh, the king sought Him out. He sought Him out. He said, where is He? He said, well, there is somebody. And he's found out where he was. The king fetched him out. I like that. By the way, that's a Bible term. Feel free to use that. Fetched him. Verse 5. And the king sent and fetched him out of the house of my car. He brought him out. Boy, there's the, there's the Christian mantra fire. There's our marching song. Fetch him out. Fetch him out. He went out. He said, where is he? He said, well, he's over in his house. He said, go fetch him. Go get him and bring him here. By the way, I'm glad God fetched me out. I'm glad God went and brought me out. That's why Psalm 40, verse number 2, He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet on a rock and established my goings. He's put a new song in my heart, even praise unto our God, that many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. He fetched me out. I'm glad He fetched me out. I'm glad he came to me. I'm glad he brought me out. And that's what we have there. We find the king's movement. He was moved. He sought him out, and the king fetched him out. I'm glad when I was age 19, he fetched me out. He worked in my heart. He saw my need. He called me, and I responded, and he saved me. What a blessed day that was. And you need to have your day, and I know and I trust that you do. Very quickly, we find the king's magnanimity. The king's magnanimity. That means his great generosity. His great generosity. Oh, when King David called him, just like when the God called you and you got saved, he, he compassionately relieved him of his fear. He compassionately relieved him of his fear. Mesibetheth, I'm not sure, knew what was going on. I'm not sure that his servant told him. He was there and he came in. All of a sudden, the king, who was his daddy had been on the side of against him, even though Jonathan was David's friend, yet Jonathan and Saul were there against David, and David had been on the run, and now he's getting the word, now that Saul and Jonathan are dead, and it's been a while, he says, King David wants to see you. He probably thought, whoop, it's over. It's over. It's been a good ride, but it's over. But he came in and fell down before him. But notice David quickly, he compassionately relieved him of his fear. He relieved him of his fear. Look at verse number 7. Verse number 6, Now when Mesibetheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mesibetheth, and answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan, thy father's sake. He relieved him of his fear. Remember the day that you got saved and relieved of your fear? Remember when you got away from God but got back right with God and relieved you of the fears? Boy, I'm so glad. The king, I'm glad the king here, he had that, helped him relieve him of his fear, and then he completely restored his loss. He completely restored his loss. Verse number 9. Then the king said unto Zibbeth, Saul's servant. Well, let's back up. Verse number 6. You know, when Mesibetheth, the son of Jonathan, to Saul, was come unto the David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mesibetheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said, him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, for thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I? The king called in Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertaineth to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that my master's son may have food to eat. But Mesibetheth, my thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba to the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mesibetheth, the king said, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Well, notice how he relieved him of his fear. He said, oh, it's me. He said, don't you fear. Don't you fear. Remember when you got saved and how you began to understand you didn't have to fear God anymore? I'm glad we fear God reverentially, but we don't have to fear Him that He's going to do us wrong. We don't have to fear God that He's going to hurt us unmercifully. We don't have to fear that. And so he came in, no doubt. Here's David. Wow, he said, I'm in trouble now. And he said, fear not. It's all right. 
It's all right. He compassionately relieved him of his fear, and he completely restored him of his loss. He completely restored him of his loss, and that's what verse number 9, And he called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertaineth to Saul and all his house. Those things that he should have had, but he lost because of what Saul had done, David said, I'm giving it back to him. Boy, aren't you glad God gives the blessings back to us? Aren't you glad that God gives more blessings beside? Great is thy faithfulness, we sing. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine and 10,000 beside. Oh, can you imagine how old Mesibetheth must have thought? He probably went in thinking he was dead meat. He said, this is over. It's all gone. David's going to have his way. But he said, David said, don't you fear. He said, I'm going to bring you in and I'm going to have you eat at my house. You're getting all of Saul's stuff back and presented to you. Whoa, the blessings beside. Think about all that was restored to us when we got saved. A relationship with God, a fellowship with God. Notice very quickly, he was given the provision of food. He was given the provision of food. Boy, I'm glad God feeds us. Boy, when we got saved, God began to feed us. And we were just, we were, see, we were just like Mesibetheth, an enemy of God, away from God, completely crippled, completely hurt, and God, by the way of Jesus Christ, calls us and saved us, and boy, He's restored us. He's given us provision of His food. He feeds us with His Word. He was given a place of fellowship. He said, He's going to sit at my table. He's going to be in my house. He said, I'm giving the land back. I'm giving His position back. I'm giving His, his family His stuff back, but He is going to be with me. He's going to sit in my house. He's going to sit at my table. He was given a place of fellowship. Aren't you glad when you got saved, you got a place of fellowship? Wow, what an exciting time. A family, a church, and a private relationship with him. But more, he was given a position in the royal family. Verse number 10. Now therefore, and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that my master's son, that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mesibetheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. He was given a position in the royal family. Wow. Think about that. He said, he's going to sit with my family. You go ahead and take care of his kids and his farms, but he, he's going to sit in the royal family. Aren't you glad you're saved tonight? Can you understand what he did for us? I was lost, but Jesus found me. I was an enemy, and Christ made peace with me. I was lame, and Jesus carries me. I was a dead dog and left a sitting son. That's what he was. He said, I'm just a dead dog. He says, no, you're going to sit my family table. <laughs> That's why Christ came that He may reconcile both to God in one body by the cross, having slain enemies thereby. Showing the kindness of God. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're to be like that servant going out and finding the ones that need to know the kindness of God. The kindness of God. And we need to be showing that. We need to be giving the gospel. We need to be finding those folks and loving them and bringing them in and leading them to restored back into relationship with God. Think back when you first got saved. Do you feel like Mesibetha? Wow. Can't imagine. Look at verse 13. So Mesibetha dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. He was undeserving in his physical way. He was undeserving in his family because Saul and Jonathan had been fighting against David and David had to defeat them to take the kingship. Are you saved tonight? I trust you are. But only you and God know that. Are you away from God? God's made the way to provision for us. But then He wants us to be like Ziba, looking for those that we can bring back to the King. We ought to have a desire like David. Who can I bring back? Who can I restore? Who's God's asking you to consider tonight? We go into this next year. We can restore, showing the kindness of God. The problem is we get so self-centered. What about me? No. What about them? We've experienced the kindness of God. We need to be like Ziba and going out and finding those to share the kindness of God. Let's bow our heads.